straight out of Scotland, this is the Reluctant Theologian Podcast. I am your host, Dr. R.C. Mullins from the University of Edinburgh. In today's episode, I sit down with T.J. Mawson to discuss a listener question on God and morality. We consider different issues related to moral philosophy, the divine nature, and providence. In what sense is God responsible for the moral landscape? What does it mean to say that God is perfectly good? And can an all-powerful God sin? After discussing these issues, we ask if God is obligated to provide atonement for humanity, and then we ask if the God of open theism can providentially guide the world without screwing things up. If you have questions or topics that you would like to hear on the show, you can send me a message at rtmullins.com. Well, ready or not, here is Tim and I feeling obliged to chat about God and morality. Enjoy. So, Tim, thank you so much for being on the show today. So I've got a listener question related to God and morality, and I was hoping you could help me out with this one and some other issues kind of related to God and morality. So if you could just read the listener question for me, that would be great. Yes, of course. So Ryan S. asks, If you have a moment, could you share your thoughts on God's obligations, more specifically his moral obligations? Does God have any? Does he have any towards humans? If God did not send Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, would he have done anything wrong? I wonder how we might philosophically justify the cross as a supererogatory act if God had no moral obligations towards his creatures. If you've got some recommendations for reading along these lines, I'd love to hear them. Grateful for you and all your work. Open up the pit. Ryan S. Right. (laughs) And so the pit there is referring to like when you're at a a heavy metal show and there's a mosh pit going on. Okay, I'll I'll have to take your word for it. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, because he knows I'm like a big uh, metal fan as well. Okay, yes, he probably didn't know that I wasn't, but I'm not going to be able to open (laughs) up much of a pit for him in that sense. Goodness knows what pits I'll encourage him to stumble towards in other (laughs) sense. (laughs) That's right. There might be some philosophical pits we'll fall into. (laughs) Maybe. So let's see if we can fall into some right now. Um, (laughs) So so let's let's like uh so i want to get to this like this all these questions he's asked here but let's back up a little bit and just kind of define some basic terms here so why don't we start with the difference between actions that are obligatory and supererogatory like uh, just define some of these terms for me okay sure yeah so um as i understand it an obligatory action uh would be an action which it's one's duty uh to perform and so uh for which one is culpable or blamable uh, at least prima facie, if one doesn't perform. Uh, so by way of an example, it's plausibly my duty to provide the tutorials, which I'm contractually obliged to provide here at the college that I teach for. I've signed a contract freely. That's given me certain duties, and it's now my uh, obligation to do those duties. If I fail to perform those duties, then uh, the college could reasonably demand of me an explanation, and if I can give a satisfactory explanation, then I'd be culpable and indeed, in principle, sackable. Mm-hmm. So those are my duties. But then I understand a supererogatory good action to be a good action which goes above and beyond the call of duty. And as such, it's one uh, for which I'm to be praised if I do do it, uh, but which I'm not uh, ordinarily going to be blamed if I don't perform it. Uh, so again, uh, for example, if having done all the duties, the teaching duties I'm contractually obliged to do, I then in my own free time, as it were, offered some extra reading groups or um, uh, seminars for my students that would arguably be a good thing that I was doing for them uh, but it would be a supererogatory good act if I didn't do that uh, hadn't done that but had just chosen to use my free time to go bowling or something I wouldn't be blamable uh, Mm -hmm. for not having done that so that's how I think I draw the distinction Okay, so the obligations, those are things I have a duty to perform. Yeah. The super, uh, well, they're super in the sense they're above and beyond, right? Yes. Yeah. Right, so I don't have a duty to do them, but they're still good to do. They're still yeah. praiseworthy in some sense. Yes. That's and if I don't do it, nobody's going to go around, well, they ought not to go around blaming me, absolutely. hopefully. Yeah, that's, yeah. My, that's my thought, yeah. Okay, so there's more to like the moral landscape than just obligations. Yeah. There's also virtues and vices. There's also the consequences of our actions. So tell me a bit about virtues and consequences and some of the role that they play in our ethical thinking. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, so I would agree, indeed, that there are uh, uh, more things in the world uh, and more things germane to moral assessment than uh, obligations. As you say, there's virtues, there's vices, there's consequences. Uh, So virtues and vices, I would understand as character traits uh, that an individual might have. Uh, So on the good side, the virtuous side, uh, one might be, for example, wise rather than foolish or generous rather than uh, stingy. And on the bad side, the vicious side, one might uh, be, as it were, for example, cruel rather than kind or intemperate rather than temperate. And so these are character traits, 
for good or bad that an individual might have and then consequences also need to be taken into account as you wisely say and uh, actions have consequences these consequences can be good or bad perhaps i'm a medical doctor on duty in a hospital's emergency room and a patient is rushed in and i need to treat the patient in a particular way if i'm going to save him before he dies of his injuries and i have that intention and out of kindness i give him some drug intending to help him recover but perhaps through no fault of my own uh, the drug is inefficacious and the patient dies anyway and in fact uh, there was another drug which if only i had had access to it would have uh, saved the patient's life mm. well in that case my intention seems to be fine i was kind uh, but the consequences of the act were suboptimal um, uh, indeed bad and so that is surely relevant to assessment overall of how well I've done in the situation, um, the consequences in that case. So it seems to me that these three things that you've picked out, one's obligations, intentions, uh, one's virtues or vices, and the consequences of one's actions are the three things, depending on where you throw the weight, that demarcate you either as a deontologist, as a virtue theorist, or as a consequentialist, the three main schools of normative theory. So the deontological view, normally associated with Kant, uh, that it's the intentions behind an act that determine its moral worth, the virtue theoretic view, normally associated with Aristotle, but it's the character traits out of which one acts in act that determine the worth of the act, and then the consequentialist view associated with a number of people, perhaps John Stuart Mill's the most famous, uh, that it's the consequences which flow from one's actions which determine its moral value. And to me, it seems that you have to bear in mind all these uh, three aspects, intentions, virtues, vices, and consequences, to triangulate, as it were, when you try to understand the moral features of agents acting. Okay, so I just remembered something. Is it, mm-hmm. you have the you have the skeleton of a very famous uh, utilitarian here in Oxford. Is that right? Uh, is possibly. It, is I it don't Bentham? Know that we do. Okay, I couldn't uh, remember. Jeremy Bentham is in University College London. Is oh, what it's ah, that's who I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, no. We don't. We don't. Uh, so we don't. Have, if we do have a skeleton of a famous utilitarian in Oxford, it's not famous enough for me to know about it. <laughs> okay. But I do know about Jeremy Bentham. Yeah, being in the lobby of University College London. Yeah. Okay. So, so hopefully one day, like maybe one of us will be famous enough to get our skeletons <laughs> somewhere of, of worth. I don't know. <laughs> well, one can only dream the dream. <laughs> right. Okay. So let's get into this next issue here. So I, I've got. I want to get into the issue that uh, the role that God plays in our morality. Okay. So before that, I think we, it would be good to kind of define a few divine attributes that are going to be relevant to that discussion. So typically theists, they want to say God is perfect in knowledge, power, and goodness. Yeah. And so God's moral goodness is, I mean, that's really important for this episode. So just kind of tell me how you define omnipotence, omniscience, and moral goodness. Yeah. So I do I do hold a, a pretty traditional theistic conception of God. So that is to say, I would concede that God is of necessity omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly good, and a number of other things. Personally, I think one should see God as outside time or atemporal, as it's usually put, perhaps better put, um, and various other things. But certainly omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly good. So I'd say that God is omnipotent in virtue of his having the most power-granting set of abilities that it's logically possible anyone might have. So quite what's in that set of abilities and what's absent from it is going to be something about which uh, finite humans are never going to be able to finally and completely reach a definitive judgment. But I think we can make uh, some fallible judgments in some cases. So, for example, it seems to me... Uh, that a being with the most power-granting set of abilities would have to be able to turn my water here in this glass into wine by a direct act of the will, should he choose to do so. Uh, So being an omnipotent being, he'd have to have the power to turn this water into wine by a direct act of the will, not needing to employ any causal mechanism to turn it into wine. But also, a being with the most power-granting set of abilities would have to be unable unable to turn this uh, water into vinegar uh, whilst trying to turn it into wine. So that's perhaps worth underscoring at this stage an omnipotent being according to my understanding can't make mistakes we can make mistakes and so we can actually do things that an omnipotent being in virtue of his power can't do so i have the ability to try to make some wine and make a bodge up of it i could uh, maybe buy one of those home wine making kits try to follow the instructions could mess it all up and i could have tried to make wine but in fact made vinegar so i have the ability to make vinegar whilst trying to make wine God doesn't have the ability to make vinegar whilst trying to make wine. Mm-hmm. Uh, he cannot but succeed in whatever he puts his hand to, whatever he tries to do. His actions cannot but meet the descriptions under which he willed them. Uh, so there are some things we can do that God in his omnipotence can't do, but those are liabilities 
that we have that he doesn't suffer under. Okay, so I want to make sure I'm yeah. following that. So sure. the yeah. most power granting set of abilities. Yeah. And so I can talk, there's a way I can talk where I can say my ability to bodge things up or screw yeah. things up. I yeah. can talk about that as ability, but really that's a liability. That's right. So mm-hmm. you might say, oh, so according to my understanding, not all abilities are powers. Some abilities are liabilities. Mm-hmm. And roughly those abilities which you'd be better off without are yeah. liabilities. And those abilities which you're better off with and with more of are powers. And so God has more of the abilities that are powers right up to the max. Mm-hmm. And he has in the end zero of the liabilities. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay, so that makes sense. Okay, so tell me the next attribute. Uh, so that was omniscience. So um, literally, of course, God's all-knowingness. So God knows of all true propositions that they're true, um, from which it follows that he knows of all false propositions that they're false. There's controversy, of course, over whether there are such propositions or ever are propositions or not, and whether there are propositions about the future or not, and so on. But uh, And there's also controversy over what knowledge is. Uh, sure. So, you know, there's a lot of little pieces there that could be prodded at and might uh, need further analysis but perhaps in this context it'd be all right to bypass at least some of them by saying uh, that of all new true propositions god believes without possibility of error that they're true and of all false propositions that he believes without possibility of error that they're false uh, and god's perfect goodness uh, was another one mm-hmm. so of necessity god intends uh, and thus does the best the morally best where there is a best or one of the joint best where two or more are equally good and uh, non better for his creatures so he always intends and does the best for his creatures so he does his duties of course uh, to revert back to that earlier point but also he does supererogatory acts for us and he manifests perfections in character where these are germane so wisdom kindness and so on so he scores according to my understanding maximally on intentions on virtues and on on consequences with regard to consequences maximally well insofar as there is a best or joint best for his creatures that might not be value maximizing per se across all possible creations but value maximizing for his creatures where there is a value maximum for his creatures to hit so like if there's like a best act he's going to perform it if yeah. there's not a best act but you know it's it is it's it's equal among a bunch a bunch of others yeah that's fine too i think that's right i think yeah okay yeah and, and okay and so i guess i just want to emphasize something so you so earlier you pointed out the moral landscape has you know obligations it also has uh, virtues it also has the consequences and you want to say all three of those are important for evaluating or i guess articulating the attribute of god's perfect moral goodness uh, yes thank you very much you've put that much better than i did <laughs> that's all right <laughs> <laughs> okay so let's get into uh, this next thing here so so a lot of theists they want to say that god is the creator of all things apart from god yeah and some even wish to say that god creates all of morality whereas others think that maybe morality could exist independently of god and so I'm, I'm kind of curious how you understand these issues. Do you think that God creates morality, or do you think that morality exists independently of God? Okay, so I think that s- some of morality exists independently of God, uh, the necessary moral truths. So examples of those would be uh, things such as that lying is in itself bad, being wise is in itself better than being foolish as a character trait, alleviating suffering is in itself better than adding to suffering as a consequence one could be bringing about. So those things are things which are, as they are, good, bad, uh, independent of any of God's creative actions. So God creates in the light of them, but he doesn't actually create them. They're independent. But other bits of morality, the contingent moral truths then, depend on choices that God made in creation, which he could have made differently. They are contingent. Uh, So that a particular sentence uh, would be me uttering a lie for example if i the sentence i'm currently wearing a pink hat uh well i tried to it with the intention of misleading you and your listeners about what hat i'm wearing mm-hmm. I'm actually wearing, wearing any hat so the sentence i'm currently wearing a pink hat were i to utter it uh, intending that would be a lie and so that's a sentence which i'm prima facie obligated not to utter uh, with that sort of intention or like to mention it or use it as an example but not to utter it with that intention because it would be a lie but of course it's contingent that i'm not wearing a pink uh hat um, that's the sort of thing God could do something about. If he wanted to, he can miracle up a pink hat, pop it on my head, inform me about its whereabouts there. And if he did all of that, then my uttering the sentence, I'm currently wearing a pink hat, would no longer be a lie. And so I wouldn't be prohibited uh, from uh, saying it uh, in this context. So the fact that I shouldn't say, given that the world is as it is, I'm currently wearing a pink hat, except by way of an example of some sort, is a contingent moral truth. And that's pr- just the sort of thing that's fully under God's control um, and he could have made different had he wished to make it different. Okay, so we've got these necessary moral truths or moral facts. They exist independent of God. Yeah. And then a whole host of contingent moral facts and or contingent moral truths. And yeah. God's responsible for, for those existing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so don't tell a lie. 
or don't torture the innocent. These yeah. are the sort of things that would be necessarily uh, yeah. true. Yeah. And that's, but that's not, I mean, that doesn't give it a lot of details for the moral landscape, right? So that's, yeah. so that's when, so when God creates a contingent world, that's going to start filling in more details. That's right. So in a way, it's good for me if, uh, that you're saying, oh, that doesn't create much uh, details for the landscape then, because it's really, if you like, just a way of mapping whatever landscape it is that God chooses to create. Yes, that's right. So that might already take some of the wind out of the sails of those who'd say, hang on, isn't this infringing on God's sovereignty that there are these things independent? Uh, Lee of his will that he creates in conformity with uh, well no because these things haven't d- d- filled in the details of a landscape in any respect they've just talked about the methods by which the landscape can be correctly described something like that might be quite good from my point of view in mm-hmm. that it does as I say seem to take maybe a bit of the wind out of some objections that might come right so let's get into that objection a okay, little bit sure. more here so so some people might go okay Maybe God's not quite as sovereign because yes. there's less things for him to be in control over. Yeah. But maybe they might also twist the knife a different way too and say, well, you know, God's supposed to be the creator of all things and yeah. he's not creating these necessary moral truths. Yeah. What's the deal there? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I might want to push them a bit and say, well, do you really think that God's creator of all things? He's not creating necessary mathematical truths either, is he? Or, or do they say, oh, no, no, I want him to create that. So I might already say, well, how much of all things do you actually think God is creator of all things? And perhaps the differences between us aren't as great as you might initially have thought. Mm-hmm. Um but I I don't really see this as diminishing God's power and sovereignty um, because I'd ask someone who pressed this point really well, diminishing power and sovereignty relative to, to what? Mm-hmm. So on my view, these things, these are necessary moral truths. They couldn't have been otherwise than, than they are. That's why they're correctly called necessary moral truths rather than right. contingent truths. So when this uh, objector gestures towards what I would claim was a pseudo-possibility, that God would have been more powerful or more sovereign if only these things were also under his creative control. Well, I'd say that this object is gesturing in the end towards nothing. They're gesturing towards an impossibility. I mm-hmm. isn't, it's not even a possibility. It's thus, I talk of it as a pseudo-possibility. So, you know, I'd say, well, you might as well wonder whether God would be more powerful if he could make black white or if he could uh, remain a necessary being whilst commit suicide or if he could make a billiard ball that was the cause of itself no god wouldn't be more powerful if per impossible he could do this which is Im- impossible mm-hmm. god's as powerful and sovereign and as anyone could possibly be and um, as there's nothing even in principle more po- powerful or sovereign than that uh, so I'm not really worried on this front, and I'd encourage the subjector not, on reflection, to be worried on sure. that front either. <laughs> so, so the idea here is, say something necessarily exists, like yeah. the idea of creating that. What, what, what would that even mean? Yes. Is, that, is that kind of the idea? Yes. Yeah. Right. And well, then, hang on, yeah. but on my view, God doesn't create himself, the person might say. Uh, exactly. Uh, and I might say, well, no, but, you know, uh, how how could anything create itself? So right. the fact that God can't create himself is no limitation on his power. Um, yeah, God can't make black, white. God can't make an object red all over and blue all over at the same time. God can't make pain in itself an intrinsically good feeling to have. Uh, okay, there's a load load of things that God can't do. But mm-hmm. when I say things that God can't do, these are impossibilities that God can't make possible. Right. But that's the thing about impossibilities. Not even God should be expected to be able to make them possible. Right. Uh, let alone natural. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at a, a different worry then. So there might be some people who say, well, hang on, uh, you've got a conflict be- between God's omnipotence and his goodness. Yeah. And some so the argument might go a bit like this. They might say, if God is all-powerful then he should be able to perform any possible action. Emphasis on possible, so not impossible, mm-hmm. of course. In which case, God should be able to perform, say, like sinful actions, because sinful actions are they're obviously possible, because, I mean, I, I do all sorts of sinful things all the time. So <laughs> it's do. clearly possible, you know. <laughs> uh, but then, like, you might want to say, well, but if God's perfectly good, well, he, he can't. He just cannot perform, like, these sinful actions. He can't do all the things that Ryan's doing. <laughs> uh, well, maybe. I don't know. Uh, so so you might say, maybe it looks like uh, if God's really perfectly good, like, would that limit his power and make it so he can't perform any possible action? And if that's right, then it seems like a perfectly good God just I mean, just couldn't be all-powerful. So I mean, how would you deal with an objection like this? Yeah, yeah, good. So yeah, so on my account, God cannot perform any sinful action. 
that and that's precisely because he's all uh, powerful and so as was mentioned earlier he doesn't actually have any liabilities abilities which it would be all things considered bad for him to exercise and being sinful is a uh, ability which it is all things considered bad for him to exercise so it's a liability mm-hmm. so it's not in the list of power granting abilities that we would in the end if we we're only able to compile it stick down as our full and complete definition of omnipotence so there are some abilities which is good to have powers there's some which is bad to have liabilities one gets more powerful the more one loses the abilities that are liabilities and gains those that are powers i uh, do do have an example here which i don't i don't know if it'll be useful or not but i'm happy to sort of put it out there and sure keep it in or or, or edit it out at a later stage so (laughs) i don't know much about cooking uh so this is possibly not a great choice of example for me but i believe that a baked alaska is a very difficult uh, dish to cook uh, requiring as it does a lot of carefully modulated steps uh, to complete successfully and any one of which is such as to mean a failure in that means that the baked Alaska as such fails to exist. <laughs> so uh, let's suppose that that's all true about making a baked Alaska and let's suppose that I as a not very accomplished cook enrolled on a course to help me make baked Alaskas. Um, now at the start of the course it may perhaps be true that I have the ability uh, to mess up the cooking of a baked Alaska in 12 distinct uh, ways. So I've got mm. 12 distinct abilities, <laughs> ways I can mess up the cooking of a baked Alaska. Okay. And as I get better at better at making baked Alaskas, I become more and more powerful as a cook of baked Alaskas, one might say, my abilities to mess up may diminish in number. So it may be that halfway through the course, I've lost six of those abilities to mess up uh, making a baked Alaska. And I can still mess it up in six ways, but there are six ways which now I just can't do. I just effortlessly, without thinking, complete the first six steps perfectly each and every time. And possibly at the end of the course, if I was to become supremely powerful as a maker of baked Alaskas, I would by then be unable to mess it up in any of the 12 ways that I had previously been able to mess it up. I could only ever make a perfect baked Alaska. You you know, you blindfold me, you tie me up, still a baked Alaska turns out. Whatever impediment you put in my way, a baked Alaska of a perfect sort turns up. So if that were the state, of course, there's metaphysical impossibilities in a human such as me becoming perfect. Uh, in power even over this relatively narrow domain of making a baked Alaska sure but if that were to be possible I think we would say right well done Tim you're now a a supremely powerful maker of baked Alaskas precisely (laughs) because you have lost all those abilities to mess up the making of baked Alaskas which you previously had and you now just have the power to make a perfect baked Alaska whenever you choose to exercise it so that I think or something similar to that is going on of course across the board of all um, uh, abilities uh, in the case of God Okay, yeah. so, right, okay, so again, like that distinction you made earlier, yeah. that, like, the most power-granting set of abilities, and yeah. so things I sometimes call abilities, they're really liabilities, yes. so they're not really powers, Yes. and right. so the sinful actions or screwing up uh, making a baked, baked Alaska, yeah. those are liabilities, that, so, yes. so they're just not going to be in the most power-granting set, so they're not, just not going to be included in the scope of omnipotence. That's, that's right, that's what I think. Yeah. Okay, and so that <laughs> seems like that would kind of dissolve any sort of conflict between omnipotence and perfect moral goodness, uh, hopefully. Yeah, that's right, the, the necessary perfect moral goodness and omnipotence would go, would go together, that's right. right. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into some other issues here now. So we've got some of these details now of how you think about God and morality. And so I want to get back into some of the questions that the listener had brought up. Mm, Yeah, good question. So do you think that God has obligations towards humans? And in particular, do you think that God is obligated to send Jesus to the cross? Yeah, uh, yes. Well, that, what a load of good questions. I wish I had some good answers to this. So you, <laughs> sure. you'd be kind enough to take us a few steps back so I can set out the sort of, you know, background to how I might go into approaching these questions. And uh, now when it comes to seeing, well, what fruits will this uh, yield? I think uh, I may be uh, embarrassingly <laughs> short of riches. Um, does God have any moral obligations? Well, in my view, yes, uh, he does. So at least I can answer that. God has moral obligations towards us. Uh, sentient morally significant uh, creatures so that's all humans for sure Uh, but also possibly some uh, non-human persons extraterrestrials of certain sorts if there are any Uh, my wife and I watch with our kids the film E.T. for the first Mm. time in our case for about 30 30 or so years there's an E.T. there's a something which isn't a human person but is very plausibly a person so God would have obligations towards E.T.s of that sort too 
Uh, he only has these obligations contingently. So if you're worried, oh, hang on, this sounds a little bit uh, as if God's sovereignty or authority might be being undermined. Well, no, no, he only has these obligations because he chose to create creatures such as us towards which uh, whom he would have obligations had God chosen to remain the sole existent being, as he might very permissibly have done. Well, then he would have had nobody other than perhaps himself to whom he could have been obligated. But in choosing to create people such as us, he has placed himself knowingly, willingly, has placed himself under obligations. He must now live up to those obligations, um, as I say. So then, okay, so yes, he has obligations. Did he have an obligation to send Jesus to die? If he hadn't sent Jesus to die, would he have done anything wrong? Well, a short answer to that is I don't really know. (laughs) Uh, So uh, that's why you might think, oh gosh, well, what was all that preamble for if he's not actually going to be able to having given an answer to the question? But I think it's epistemically possible, for me anyway, that human salvation might have been equally well accomplished in some other way than Jesus being crucified. So let's say uh, that we have a person who we may refer to as the second person of the Trinity and that as a matter of fact that second person of the Trinity is the person who actually became incarnate and led the life that we read about and associate with the name Jesus in the Gospels. But that a person who we refer to by the name third person of the Trinity could equally well have become incarnate and led a life which was a simulacrum of the life that was actually led by the second person of the Trinity. And had he done so, then that third person of the Trinity would be the person who we now refer to uh, using the name Jesus. So if so, then even if God the Father had to send some divine person to do the job and he, he couldn't do it himself, he needn't have sent the divine person he actually sent, viz. the second person of the Trinity, and so would that have been a case of Jesus not having been sent? Well, it does depend a little bit on how you would use the word Jesus. The way I mm-hmm. suggested we use it, it would probably still have been Jesus being sent, but it would have been a different person being Jesus. Right. So that's a possibility for me, epistemically. But I don't know, perhaps the internal relations between members of the Trinity, uh, which of course are disagreed about by Christians, does right. the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father and the Son, or solely from the Father and so on. So perhaps some of these pretty are obtuse hard to discover <laughs> properties that are pertain between members of the trinity might in fact make one member of the trinity uniquely capable of atoning for the sins of uh, humanity and if it does then in fact that which seems epistemically to me to be possible god could have sent the third person of the trinity as well as the second might not actually be possible um, in which case his obligation might have only been able to be uniquely filled by uh, sending jesus so that's one aspect to this. Mm-hmm. There's a there was something about sort of thing about your the superrogatory. Something about how might we justify the, the cross as a supererogatory? Uh, right. Uh, perhaps God could have saved us from the effects of sin in some other way that was less good for us. And if so, then He might have fulfilled His duties to us, but not as been as good to us as He has been had He done that. So perhaps God didn't even need to send a divine person to meet His obligations to us and to others perhaps an angel could have been sent instead if such an angel had volunteered i don't know again of course being of necessity perfectly good god would have chosen the best means if there was a best even if that was a super augurally good thing so he would have gone above and beyond the call and duty if there was a unique way to go above and beyond the call of duty and do for us what was best so uh but uh, yeah in this area as i say in the end i don't know because i think one would need to know things about the internal Mm -hmm. mechanics of the hypostatic union to make progress and that's an area which as i say is to me at least uh somewhat opaque there is a lot of opaque metaphysics going on there (laughs) so let me see i want to make sure i'm following this wrong so right so if i'm god i've got the ability to create or not create i'm free to do you know whatever i want there yeah if I don't create anything, no obligations to anyone but myself because, yeah. well, there's no one else that exists, so yeah. I can't have obligations to these other people. Yeah. But if I create them, though, if I create creatures of particular sorts, like yeah. uh, like persons, yes. they've got value su- yeah. to such an extent that I do have certain obligations to them. Yeah. I'm God. I know that going into it, so I know I'm taking on these obligations. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing like when God enters into a covenantal relationship or yes. makes a promise. Yes. He knows what he's doing, so yes. he's freely taking on these yes. obligations. That's a good good example, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's why God contingently has obligations. Yeah. And then when we get when we fast forward to the incarnation of Jesus, yeah, I mean, it is a pretty standard medieval view that yes. any of the divine persons could yes. become incarnate. It is. Yeah. 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 And if, I mean, there's lots of dead people we could have as our authorities. Um, Medievals tend to be a favorite one uh, for some reason. And so they seem to all agree any of the divine persons could become incarnate. Uh, So if that's the case, then yeah, it does seem a bit difficult for me to pin down exactly what 
the obligation would be there because it seems like, well, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, any of those would, would fulfill the duty yeah. if there is an obligation here, yeah. which I I don't know. Yeah. Because, uh, well, this is an area where all of our favorite uh, dead medievals, they disagree on, um, <laughs> does he have to send a son? Or could he do it some other way? Yeah. Yeah. So if you think it, it, an incarnation would be obligatory, then any of the three persons could have done it. So which one from there? Yeah. There's no obligation there. Yeah. So there's a couple different ways I guess you could really kind of develop yes. this. Well, I'm more than a couple. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of ways. But yeah, yeah, but that's kind of the thinking here. Yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thank you again for putting it probably more clearly than I put it myself. <laughs> I, we'll see. Um, maybe people might be horribly confused after this episode. <laughs> so let's get into a final topic here. Sure. So this is going to be related to God's goodness and his providence. So as you know, there's multiple models of God on offer today. And so one popular model is called open theism. And so on open theism, God does not infallibly know what will in fact happen in the future. So God knows all the possible things that could happen in the future, and he could make incredibly accurate predictions about what will happen. But open theists say that God doesn't in fact know how the future is going to go. Yeah. And they're going to agree with you. They want to say God's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's morally good. Like they want to maximize all those. uh, Yeah. So imagine that they agree with your definitions of omnipotence, omniscience, and moral goodness here. So they're, oh, they're trying to be on the same like playing yeah. field as you. Like, do you think the open theist can actually consistently maintain that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and, and perfectly good? Or do you think they're going to run into a problem here? Yeah, so I think they, they run into a problem. Yeah, so in a way, I'm glad that they've granted me my definitions of omnipotence, omniscience, and perfect goodness, because I think by granting me that, I've got all I need to run an argument for why their problems are insuperable. So I'm not a fan of open theism. I think it does lead to retreat uh, from ascribing to God omnipotence, as I've understood it. And of course, I think that's the best understanding we could have of it, of Mm -hmm. omniscience, (laughs) and again, and of perfect goodness. So I I have an argument in this connection in which I introduce and deploy uh, a notion which I call bodging, and I define uh, bodging thusly. So I'll define it, then I'll give an example which is similar to an example I gave before to just... Yeah, that's good, because this is a... like When I've had American students, they're like, what is that? I'm like, it's an English word. You know, it's okay. Yes, yes. (laughs) Maybe it says something about our difference of cultures that the Americans don't have a word for bodging. Mm -hmm. They probably just put up a banner that says mission accomplished where someone (laughs) British would have a banner that said mission bodge. But uh, without wishing to raise the hackles of any of your uh, North American listeners who are great fans of people associated with banners saying mission accomplished let me tell you a little bit more about bodging so one bodges an action on my understanding of a term if one performs it under an intended description that it doesn't in the end end up meeting so imagine this by way of an illustration so your doctor in a hospital's emergency room uh, you need to make a very quick decision on how to treat a particular patient who's just been rushed in and is in front of you if you don't act immediately then he's certainly going to die so you've got to do something you could administer either drug a or drug b Uh, The efficacy of each of these drugs depends on its radioactive properties, the effects of which have the following physical probabilities which you know about. So you know that drug A has a 60% chance of saving him, a 40% chance of killing him all the sooner. Drug B has a 40% chance of saving him and a 60% chance of killing him all the sooner. So therefore you choose, rationally, what would you choose? Well, of course, you choose drug A, intending thereby to save your patient. Mm -hmm. But in fact, you're unlucky and your patient is even more unlucky. Uh, That which was objectively (laughs) unlikely to happen in fact happens, uh, so you in, end up unintentionally killing your patient whilst intending to do the opposite. You tend to save him, you've actually killed him, this dr- drug you've administered has killed him. So your action hasn't met the description under which you willed it, the description of the drug, I'm trying to give him the drug that will save him, uh, and so your patient's died and you've bodged in my sense of, uh, in sense of bodged. So if we, so now let's think, okay, is it a power or liability to be able to bodge, bodge things? Mm. Okay. And now people's intuitions may uh, differ um, on this, but to me it seems pretty obvious that to being able to bodge things is itself a liability. Uh, so I could bodge up making a baked Alaska in 12 different ways in my previous example. Mm-hmm. Each of those was a separate liability. When I became unable to bodge making a baked Alaska in any way, as I was in my thought experiment, I became more powerful relative to the domain of making baked Alaskas thereby. So it seems to me that it's best to think of God's uh, omnipotence as entailing an inability to bodge 
And it's an impossible for an atemporal God to bodge things because all descriptions which are true of his actions are equally and infallibly known by him as he eternally wills the actions. And in particular, all the things that his actions will lead to from the point of view of us in time, not just the probabilities of what they might lead to, but what they'll actually lead to uh, in the future from our point of view are before his mind as he chooses those actions. But it is possible for the open theist gods to bodge things because it can't be that all the descriptions which are true of his actions are equally and infallibly known by him as he temporal he wills them mm-hmm. in particular it's not the case that all the things that his actions will lead to are known to him all of them in fact are matters of contingency and uncertainty for him so perfect being theology seems to me to give one reason to favor the atemporalist conception of god over the open theist because it removes finally the possibility of god bodging on open theism god almost certainly bodges quite a bit and that makes him a less perfect being uh, less perfect in power and i'd say in omniscience and in perfect goodness uh, all these three are in hazard if one goes down the open theist path so that that in a nutshell is is what i would say okay so if i got the the if i have the ability to budge that yeah. kind of diminishes my power yeah and then I, I've already said, well, if I'm an open theist, uh, then I don't think God infallibly knows the future. And so yeah. you want to say, well, that's a, that's a drop in the knowledge. Yeah. And then if I really could screw things up, like maybe I'm not as good consequentially as I really could be. Yes. This is a drop in goodness. And so you want to say you've got to drop in all three of these powers or yes. these attributes. Yes. Compared yes. to uh, a more like traditional understanding of God. That, yes, that's what I would say. I think. Yeah. Okay, so imagine the open theist says something like this. They're like, I've got a rejoinder here. Uh-huh. Um, so on the standard kind of views of open theism, they'll say, God's got this goal for creation, you know, uh, enter into a loving relationship with as many people as possible. Right. And so that's the, like the intended goal. Mm-hmm. And they'll also say he's got this sort of exhaustive contingency plan. So yeah. if Tim does this, uh, you know, he doesn't really know for a fact if Tim's going to do this, but if he yeah. does this, oh, this is what I'm going to do instead. And so that way he can make sure that he does satisfy this goal because he's got this huge exhaustive contingency plan to make sure he gets exactly what he wants in the end Mm -hmm. which way will it go to get there to that result i don't know uh but i've got a good probability uh, that i hear so maybe it's 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 really negligible any sort of risk of bodging do you think like that might help the open theist out a bit or do you think you could kind of dig in your heels and go you still have this drop in these different attributes yes i think i think i mean if i may i say a bit of both i think it helps him out a bit Mm -hmm. uh but uh you've still got a significant drop it doesn't secure him against all bodging. It probably, well, it does secure him against ultimately bodging or bodging in some irretrievable way. Yeah. And I think it would be reasonable to say that, well, it's really bodging in an irretrievable way that mm-hmm. we we are against. So, Tim, if you had a capacity to bodge making a baked Alaska in 12 discrete ways, however, you could always, you know, remedy it by sort of adding some emergency treatment into your cooking process at a later stage. Mm-hmm. Maybe we wouldn't regard the fact that you'd bodged in those 12 ways given that they were always remediable ways yeah as such a big liability relative to the person who could never even bodge in the first place so uh, and i i do see some force in that so i think uh, in essence and in overview i'd say probably uh, yes god's having these contingency plans does take a little bit of the wind out of my sails but uh not all the wind i've i've still got uh, a bit of puff <laughs> left mm-hmm. as it were that yeah. i can blow blow your way so so let, let, let's let me say a little bit more about that so yeah on open theism i i think absolutely right god may be pictured and is, you know is best pictured you know uh, as having contingency plan for every possible future and infallibly knowing of some possible futures how he would then not freely at that stage if he infallibly knows it earlier but not freely at that stage but how he would interact so as to as it were um, get his nuts out of the fire once he's dropped his nuts into the fire mm-hmm. so if you like the worst case scenario uh, where god bodges on every occasion it's possible for him to bodge isn't as bad as we might think for the occasions on which it's possible for him to bodge are rather smaller fewer i should say than we might think so god is a gambler but he can't gamble away the farm as mm-hmm. it were you know, okay. in the end that's he's going to get round and it's going to it's going to be all right um and there's another control as well you, you have mentioned actually i think it's absolutely legitimate to bring in on how bad things can get for the bodging god uh, which is that the bodging god has even more than we have the ability to put things right so when we bodge up in some ways often we do have the power to sort of you know make a different uh decision at a later stage and and make things better than you know they looked as if they were going to be given our earlier bodge up and god would be able to do all the sorts of things we can do uh, plus extras in addition because he can perform miracles so he can perform a miracle including if nothing else would suffice he can sort of just destroy certain sections or even the entirety of creation and start those sections or the entirety of it again and in this context i always think about the uh, story in the bible about noah and the oh, flood right. And I think the most natural reading of that story, I mean, it does say that God regretted what he'd done. The Mm -hmm. most natural reading of that story would have it 
uh, that God did bodge. Uh, with the exception of Noah and his family, mankind had fallen so far short of a standard that God had intended for them, that God had bodged so badly that he had no alternative other than to uh, destroy all of humanity, with the exception of Noah and his family, and start again. And, you know, one lifeboat needed, and he didn't even have to miracle that into existence. He got Noah to build it for himself. So that's the most natural reading of uh, the story. But I wonder if the most natural reading of that story actually conforms with our best understanding of what a perfectly good being would mm-hmm. be like yeah and i i incline to think not <laughs> you'd hope not <laughs> and then i incline to go with our most philosophically um sophisticated or plausible account of what a perfect being would be like over the most natural reading and go back and read in the light of that so it does seem to me that open theism does lead to a retreat it's not a route um, but it's a retreat uh, from the position occupied by the atemporalist. Mm-hmm. Ascri- the atemporalist can ascribe to God unlimited omniscience and infallibility. Having surrendered ground on the omniscience front, the open theist must fall back on the omnipotence front too, in conformity mm. with that. His or her God must be admitted to be capable of bodging things, that is to say, performing actions which he reasonably expected would meet certain descriptions, and performed intending them to meet those descriptions, but which nevertheless didn't end up doing so. Uh, he may have contingency plans, but it's fantastically unlikely he won't bodge up some of the time. And having fallen back on that front, the temporalist must either say that whatever goodness in the sense of beneficence mm-hmm. and virtue, not just benevolence. So benevolence, I think he's fine. He said God's intentions can be pure on my model. But in terms of um, the virtues, and in terms of beneficence, not just benevolence, uh, what goodness God has in those dimensions has to be a matter of luck. Uh, right, yeah. he thus has to fall back on saying of God's perfect goodness that it's a matter of luck if he has it and it's fantastically unlikely he would have it or adopt a view of what makes for goodness which is very atrophied which only talks about God's intentions doesn't talk about his virtues doesn't talk about the consequences he's actually going to be able to bring about uh, or does bring about so I think to me in some way open theist picture I'd have to believe it's a consistent one they need to retreat on these fronts but they're not routed mm-hmm. Some people warm to the picture that emerges and think of the God that it depicts as the greatest sort of person that's logically possible, but I'm not one of them. To me, it seems the open theist is committed to a partially ignorant God, Mm -hmm. one who's subject to the vagary of luck for the efficacy of at least some of his actions, one who almost certainly bodges, and one who's dependent on chance for whatever goodness in the full-blooded sense, meaning beneficence and virtue as well as benevolence, whatever goodness in that full-blooded sense he might happen to achieve. And when it comes to being a perfect being, it seems to me quite possible that reality could do better than that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Okay. So so what it sounds like here is you can say, okay, I, you can get out of, you can prevent God from having an ultimate bodge, but there's still a lot of ways to bodge up along the way. Yes. And so... The fact that you've still got a bodge along the way that's still yeah. possible, that's going to be a drop in, in power and in goodness. Yeah. And then they've already given up infallible knowledge of the future, so that's yes. a drop in om- om- omniscience. Yeah. So, okay, I guess in my mind right now, it seems like if the open theist would want to make a comeback here, what they would yes. have to say is, well, there's nothing logically greater than this. Like, they'd have to try to rule out all the other things you want to say are possible in terms of omnipotence, omniscience, yes. and, and moral goodness. So that would be a completely different debate, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but, that, that but that seems to be right here. So yeah, if you you can say, look, you've got to drop here, here, and here in these divine attributes, so it's not maximal. Yeah, and they would have to say, well, I can tell you it's maximal because these reasons are why anything above that's impossible. Yes, and that like yeah, there's a different debate though. Yes, and so there they would be sort of replicating in a way a, a criticism I made of mm-hmm. someone earlier when I when someone said, oh, but a god of this sort would be sovereign over morality in a way that your god isn't, and being sovereign over morality is obviously better than not being. Yeah, ergo your Mawson's god is you know not to be preferred over my god on the grounds of perfect being theology. And they might be able to, or I, of course I don't think they can, but they sure, might right. sort of want to be able to say, well, look, it's the same here. You, know, you think this would be better than uh, what we've got, but uh, if we can show you that this is in fact impossible, it wouldn't be better than what we've right. got. <laughs> uh, and so let's let's go on the offensive there and try and find some impossibilities in there. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, and so the debate yeah. would go on. <laughs> exactly. So thank you so much for being on the show today. It's yeah. absolutely fascinating. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's It's been a pleasure, and I hope your listeners have found what I've had to say interesting and thought-provoking. And there you have it, another episode of the Reluctant Theologian Podcast. Stay tuned for episodes on theological language. 